So I'll start with a little story. Last summer, um, after seven years of running a very successful worldwide executive coaching practice, I found myself hired by a major hedge fund in New York City. And it wasn't the first time this had happened, but it was the first time that I found myself coaching the entire investment team of a hedge fund that literally had no female employees except for one secretary. I will tell you that 90% of my executive coaching practice is dedicated to women. So this was a very unusual situation for me to find myself in. And what I learned very rapidly as I spent a few weeks evaluating how this leadership team was working was that they, in fact, had not hired me to come in and actually assist them in shifting all the problems that they had internally. But the male managing partners very much just wanted to justify exercising a very traditional model of leadership, even if it meant all of their employees hated them, quit, and they had incredibly high turnover. I woke up in the middle of the night, in the middle of this process at 3 o'clock in the morning, and thought, what the hell am I doing with these people? Um, and it was at that moment that I realized that my entire career and my entire life in many ways has been dedicated to the growth of women's leadership generally. And at that moment, at 3 o'clock in the morning, the Gaia Project for Women's Leadership was born. It's really only been in the last 30 or 40 years that we've seen women rise into powerful leadership roles in the corporate world. That follows centuries of a very traditional masculine model of leadership. That traditional masculine model of leadership really has valued only two metrics when we look at success. It has valued the amount of time we put in and the amount of money that we bring to the table and literally nothing else. There are many, many ways in which these metrics of success don't match up to the role of women in the workplace, period. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today in some detail. It also, however, has led a lot of us to internalize the idea that the only way that we can succeed is to work harder, longer, more, to our detriment, to tremendous overwhelm, and honestly, to damage in all areas of our lives. For this reason, despite the fact that I have worked with Sheryl Sandberg's people, I am a bit of a critic of Lean In. And I'm very candid about this, because Lean In, in fact, advocates that we all just simply ascribe more to a traditionally masculine model of leadership. Work harder, do more, be present, network after the job, you know, and to our own detriment, perhaps, many of us are not billionaires who can afford to have a lot of childcare at home. <laughs> many of us are not in a position where we actually have any time to do anything else that, adv that advances our career. And so, in fact, one of the things that we're engaged in right now at the Gaia Project is this conversation about the opportunity, the incredible opportunity we have right now as women leaders to change the definition of leadership generally. And that's where we start today. So I'm going to share with you today nine pivot points around the new paradigm of women's leadership. But I'm going to ask you all to envision these nine pivot points as a circle. What I'm offering you today is something of a circle of all the different tastes of women's leadership and the various ways in which you can access this new paradigm of women's leadership to your own benefit and to the benefit of women everywhere. So pivot point number one is about knowing your worth. This, to me, is such a critical starting point, in part because we have been told for so long that we are not worthy of occupying leadership roles, that we are not as good at being leaders as men, that we do not deserve to be in positions of leadership, and it is incredibly difficult to not internalize this. I was asked at dinner last night, as I am asked every time I do a talk around these sorts of issues, about what the number one thing is that women face when they come into my executive coaching practice or into one of our programs. And that number one thing is the imposter complex. There is not a single woman that I have worked with who has not experienced the sense at some point that she doesn't know what she's doing, that she's a fraud, and that she doesn't deserve to be there. Not knowing our worth impacts our ability to earn. But beyond that, it impacts our ability to share our gifts with the world. I happen to be one of those people who believes that we're all here for a purpose, and we all have a unique mission and a unique set of qualities and gifts that we were brought here to provide. And if we do not know our worth and we do not stand up for it, we are denying those who need our gifts the ability to access them. The more that you can do to offload that, to give it back to where it came from, it is baggage that does not belong to us. If I get really uppity feminist about it, I will tell you I think it belongs to patriarch and it's time we gave it back. Do that work. Do that work for yourself as an individual, and it will benefit other women. So that's pivot point number one, know your worth. The second pivot point has to do with standing in your role as a leader. Because we are talking about new paradigm women's leadership, and this is part of the invitation of this talk today, 
I want to invite those of you who may be suffering the same level of discomfort to consider whether leadership can be something else. Everyone in this room, by the way, and I've met most of you now, regardless of how you choose to define yourself, is a leader in terms of what you're doing. You may not yet have achieved everything that you wanted to achieve in your career, or you may be at the very pinnacle of your industry. But you, simply by showing up and being here and engaging in this conversation, have taken a step toward your own leadership. So being willing to take that step forward and say, I am here to lead, is a big part of redefining leadership generally. Pivot point number three is about uncovering and using your voice. I am not saying by any stretch of the imagination that it is always easy or that it is easy for all of us to use our voices. But I will tell you that if we do not call out, for instance, unconscious bias when we see it, if we do not use our voices to advocate for other women in the workplace, we are not fundamentally living up to our potential and sharing our gifts as women leaders. The fourth pivot point, and this is where the rubber really meets the road in my book, is about aligning your life with your values. What that means is that we have to become effective in this new paradigm of women's leadership in looking at our lives as holistic and not just as worker and home, leader and home. We have to start looking at the values of our own lives and what matters to us and then making choices that align with them. I work with plenty of women who really want to be home to have dinner with their families at night. They really want to be home from 6 to 8 o'clock. They don't want to be on their phones. Spending time with their kids really matters to all of us. It matters to me tremendously. Um, and also want to have the opportunity to really decompress and disconnect from the office. And yet, what I hear over and over again is I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. If I'm not there when that email comes in, something horrible is going to happen. I am again here to tell you that's a big fat lie. Um, and I happen to be someone who also advocates for the idea that if that is really what you value, if when you don't sit down and have dinner with your family, you've got that nagging feeling in the pit of your gut that your life is getting away from you, that is within your control. Yeah. I take some of my coaching clients who are in the situation, and I, as I always am, want to say, you can blame the coach. But I say to them, you have to go home and stick your phone in a drawer for two hours. Nothing terrible really happens 99% of the time when you put your phone in a drawer for two hours. That most crises at work are not true crises. And that most people can wait two hours for a response to an email without anything really horrible happening. There are examples, I guarantee you, in your workplace, if you believe you can't make these kind of choices, there are examples of people who are successful who have made them. And that should be all the evidence you need that you can do the same. And you'd be a little surprised how quickly, when you start to set boundaries, however small, it becomes easier to set bigger and bigger and bigger ones. These are the things that allow us to align our lives to what we value most. Until you start setting boundaries, no one will respect them. You have to respect them first. So that's pivot point number four. Pivot point number five is about leading by example. One of the questions I get is, I, how can I find time to do this? Like, sure, I'd love to kind of change the world for women everywhere, but I'm already overwhelmed. And my answer to that is that by leading by example, by showing other women how to lead a life in alignment with your values, by showing male executives in your company how you are leading a life that is in alignment with your values, you are giving other women permission to do the same, and you are showing people in the traditional masculine model of leadership that there's a different way to do it. So taking the brave step to align your own life to what matters to you creates a model that other people can ascribe to. And even better, it shows women who are coming up the chain of command behind you, and even our daughters and our sons, that there is a way to be successful and still be happy. So pivot point number six, my big bugaboo, is about ending the zero-sum game in women's leadership. They have managed to convince us that there is not room for all women to rise. And the insidious thing about this experience that we have had of thinking that there is only room for so many of us is that it has convinced many of us that we have to compete with each other to get ahead. That in order for one of us to win, another one has to fail. And you'll note that this is awfully convenient to traditional masculine leadership because when we're competing with each other and tearing each other down or worried about what she's got that I don't have, we're not working together to lift each other up. Speaking of big fat lies, the idea that there's not room for all of us at the top is probably the number one on that list. Because as Ruth Bader Ginsburg put it, there's no reason why we can't have nine women on the Supreme Court. 
right? It's just a matter of a lack of imagination. What are you doing to uplift other women in your workplace? What are you doing to uplift other women on your team? At that moment where you find yourself with a trigger of envy about another woman who has a level of success that you have, are you asking yourself the pivotal question about your own desire? She wants something that I have. That's about what I want for myself. How do I create that? That's not about her being a bad person. That doesn't require me to tear her down. It requires me to look internally at what I can do to create that for myself. The less that we compete with each other, the more we all rise. When one of us wins, we all succeed. And the more that we can start to operate in a collective format of imagining that we all rise together, the more room there is for all of us at the top. Pivot point number seven, and again, we're going here toward the outside once again, is about being a change agent in the world. There is this idea that if it has been hard on us, really hard, brutally hard, we've been hazed, we've been sexually harassed, we've lived through horrible circumstances to rise to this level of success, that that has proved our mettle and that therefore other women should have to experience an equally tough time rising. That is a very dangerous mentality for the future of women's leadership. <laughs> Simply having a conversation with the most junior woman on your team about how she can start to take control of her career is changing the world. Pivot point number eight is something that is truly critical in my book to women's success, and that is having your inside equal your outside, or in the kind of big keyword that we hear so much these days, authenticity. So many people will tell you that I am very much that person who is what you see is what you get. I'm not swearing up here as much as I do in real life, but that's probably the only difference in terms of what you will see. Um, and I, it took me a long time to get there, to be comfortable, for instance, being vulnerable, to be comfortable enough to say to my team now, or even when I was on Wall Street, I'm not the right person for that job. I, I'm really not very good at that. It's time for us to pull somebody else in. And so part of my authenticity is about saying, this is what I'm really not very good at. This is what I don't know. But it's also about not living a life where I'm one person at work and I'm another person at home. Because that misalignment is really hard and people pick up on it. This is the other thing. It's like our authenticity as women leaders, our ability to be present for our teams and the people that we work with is part of our currency. And if we can show other women that it's okay to be vulnerable, that it's okay to not know everything, that it's okay to not be perfect and to own our mistakes and to continue to grow and learn, we also make it easier for men who are making decisions to align with women who aren't perfect. We need to be real, in other words, if we're going to create a new paradigm of women's leadership that allows us to be whole human beings and not just valued on our time and our money. And that brings me to pivot point number nine, which is about owning our power, our new and fundamental power in the world and in the workplace, our capacity to run families and companies and fingers crossed, nations in the United States, I'm hopeful. Um, and a big part of that is about, in my view, the willingness to take up that space. Before I walk into a room that I have not occupied before, before I sit down at a table that I have not sat down at before, I have this thing in my body that goes, and I literally physically take up more space. That deep inhale is the requirement, in my view, that all of us are being called to right now at this moment in history as women leaders. We are all being called to take the deep inhale that takes us to the next level of sharing our gifts with the world. I deserve to be here. I deserve to take up this space and I have something to contribute that no one else on the planet can add to this conversation at this minute in time. It's the deep inhale. And I'd invite you all now to take the big inhale and own your space. Thank you so much for your time today and for listening to this. And I can't wait to handle questions from all of you this afternoon. It's been such an honor to be here.